Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my dissertation work as it relates to biodiversity and vulnerability of aquatic insects in California. So throughout the talk, I will go over a biodiversity review study where we reviewed biodiversity of selected groups in California streams, really focusing a little bit more on the details of aquatic insects and their uh, conservation status. I'll also tell you about a, the California Odonata database that I developed as part of CalBug, which is a project to di digitize entomology collections in California, and um, go over some of the results from a resurvey study that I did looking at changes in species traits and occurrence rates over time in California, and how we might use this kind type of data to um, begin to, to focus conservation assessments for some of these um, groups that haven't been as well studied. So I'll conclude with some next steps in doing that. So the study groups that we focused on in our biodiversity assessment were several orders of aquatic insects, including EPT, Odonata, Coleoptera, and Hemiptera. We also reviewed mollusks, crustaceans, diatoms, macrophytes, fish, and amphibians. And we did this work a few years ago in 2012. Um, the data came from largely museum collections. Um, so what we found was we compiled um, a list of a total of 2,837 species for these groups. Um, the groups that we know the most about, fish and amphibians, only happen to comprise about 5% of the species on our list, whereas the diatoms and the aquatic insects are the hyperdiverse hyper groups that we know the least about, for good reason, because they are less known taxonomically and we don't know as much about their distribution. So I'm going to focus on aquatic insects, which is a big data gap that we have, um, but, but what that rep represents, 40% of the total known diversity on our list. Um, this box on the right here is showing the individual orders of aquatic insects. And you can see that odonates have a relatively low diversity that's on par with fish and amphibians, but we happen to know the most about this group. And um, it still represents, despite knowing our um, better knowledge of this, this particular order, we still have a lot of um, room for improvement in our conservation assessments for this group. So this is showing the um, percentage of taxa listed as in decline by um, state and federal lists of threatened and endangered species in the black and the light gray. Um, only 2% of the species on our list have been evaluated by state and federal um, listings. The IUCN red list includes um, some more groups, uh, including the mollusks and odonates, which are not covered at all in the state and federal list. So there are no, uh, no aquatic insects on these lists that actually provide uh, legal protection for species. And there's only one, one odonate, which is an endemic damselfly, um, Ischnera gemina, that's found in the San Francisco Bay Area that's listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. And I just wanted, you saw this slide earlier um, the, from the Nature Conservancy effort to um, document freshwater biodiversity in, throughout the state of California. And I just wanted to point out this data gap that they found as well for insects and other invertebrates in that 70% of this group has not been evaluated. Sorry. Um, so now I just wanted to get into some work that I did uh, with odonates um, and how we might assess vulnerability through an analysis of change over time. So this Odonata occurrence database that I mentioned has records spanning from 1879 through 2013, and it was part of an effort known as CalBug to database entomology collections throughout the state. Um, so all of the major entomology collections throughout California, we have records of Odonate specimens from all of these collections, as well as two of the largest collections outside of the state of California. Um, we also have included some vetted observation data from a, a local enthusiast group called Cal Odes that report their sightings of Odonates throughout the state and Odonata Central. And so this database includes over 32,000 records of 
um, all species of odonates that are known to occur here, 106 species. And I just wanted to show how we can use this um, a database like this is sort of a data discovery tool to identify promising data, data sets for further study. Um, this is just showing the distribution of records over time and you can see, so these different spikes in the number of records are largely the, re the result of collections by odonate specialists. And this first one in the early 1900s was um, work by Clarence Hamilton Kennedy throughout California and N Nevada. And he published his findings of, of odonate uh, assemblages at different sites throughout this region in the proceeding, proceedings of the National Museum. So um, part of my work, I resurveyed these sites and I wanted to tell you a little bit about some results that we found in relation to changes in biological traits of, of odonate assemblages and individual species occurrence rates. And I just wanted to show you these pictures of, this is one of the sites in um, the Owens River in the Owens Valley of California in 1914 and in 2012. So this included adult surveys of odonates at 45 sites across Central California and Nevada. Um, the surveys were done during the flying season from late April through mid-September. All of them occurred within one to two weeks of their original sample date. And I replicated, temp attempted to replicate the effort of the original survey by visiting each site the same number of times or more, which meant each site was visited two to five times over the period of 2011 to 2013. Um, I used a multi-species generalized linear mix model to look at changes in species traits since 1914. Um, and what this model was doing is looking at the presence or absence of, of species as a function of, of interactions between the fixed effects of the time period and each of, each of a series of um, species traits. So every species is associated with species traits and these included dispersal, um, habitat specialization, tolerance values, generation time, and overwintering diapause. And we also included random effects of family, genus, and species to account for any um, potential correlations brought about by highly related species. And we also included site as a random effect. So what we found was that habitat specialists have declined significantly, which is something that we had expected considering that um, many habitat specialists across um, a variety of organisms have declined over time in that they are less able to find suitable habitat um, in, in a new location if their current habitat becomes degraded. We also found a decline in species with an overwintering diapause, which was interesting because, um, so this, the overwintering diapause is a, a trait to withstand cooler winter temperatures. So with, with um, warming temp winter temperatures and higher variation in temperature may place these species at, at a disadvantage because they, they may um, experience the temperature threshold cues for the onset of egg diapause or hatching at inopportune times. Um, we then found that migratory species have increased significantly. Um, many migratory species have a tropical origin. There are five migratory species in California so they're generally um, particularly warm adapted and they may experience um, faster growth rates and um, a longer reproductive period with warmer temperatures. But, and they're also the best dispersers, of course, so they can, they're the best able to find suitable habitat. And this graph is just showing the changes in the proportion of habitat specialists, species with a diapause and migrants um, over time. We also looked at changes in individual species occurrences. Um, it, this table on the left is showing the, all, of the, all of the species with the highest declines in occurrences. And nearly all of these are habitat specialists indicated by the S. And these are restricted to certain types of streams, wetlands, forests, or high elevation areas. Overall, we found that 21% of habitat specialists in increased while 78% declined, so much more than declined. In contrast, on the, the table on the right shows the species with the highest increases, 
and these are nearly all habitat generalists that inhabit a variety of ponds, lakes, streams, canals, irrigation ditches. 62% um, of these increased while 37% declined. So we found that it, the average percentage of generalists at each site increased by 18% and that there's a significant homo homogenization of, of um, dragonfly assemblages with the expansion of habitat generalists and the decline of specialists. So I wanted to end with some conclusions and next steps in determining vulnerability of aquatic insects. Um, I would like to do some targeted conservation assessments um, with the goal to, to protect a larger variety of freshwater habitats than may currently be protected under species that are listed as threatened or endangered, which are mostly vertebrate species. So to do this, we might target rare species, um, species that are geographically restricted, species that have declined over time, such as they've demonstrated with the resurvey study. Um, we can use these estimates of decline to identify particular species that may need conservation assessments, and we can, um, or particular traits like habitat specialization, um, species that are specialized for stream habitats or high elevation areas are really coming out as, um, as, as some of the species with the highest declines. We might also target sensitive biological indicators such as the EPP taxa. We may even want to perform genus level assessments because there are undoubtedly certain genera with species declining across the board and we could then use more bioassessment data for some of these um, assessments. But the bottom line is that we need more data for aquatic insects and specimen databases are a good place to start. So uh, one of the things that I hope we're able to do is improve specimen databases, include um, other more sensitive aquatic insects such as EPP um, and, and have the data from the, the historical data from the museum collections. But we also, in addition to this, need more information on the life history and, and ecology of, of some of these species that then informs how we protect their habitats. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, funding sources and everyone who helped out with the project and um, invite any questions. <laughs>